It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Your Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my question to the Premier, a very uh, simple question of basic economics. Does the Premier believe that there is a direct causal relationship between rapidly increasing energy prices in Ontario and the hollowing out of our manufacturing sector, the tune of 324,000 lost manufacturing jobs? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, what I what I know is that there are companies that are coming to Ontario, Mr. Speaker. There are jobs being created in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, the the reality is that our energy prices are competitive with our neighboring jurisdictions. The member from Northumberland, the member from Renfrew, come to order. That the case. We put in place programs to deal with uh, with particular sectors, Mr. Speaker, like Northern Industrial. And as I said, uh, we believe that the uh, the plan that we have in place, which is investing in people and in infrastructure. That's needed by communities and creating that business environment that is competitive is working, Mr. Speaker, which is why businesses are coming to the province. Is there more that needs to be done? Absolutely. And we are going to continue to play to our strengths and put those, uh, put those conditions in place, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. It's almost like the Premier is inferring that higher energy prices are attracting jobs yep. to the province of Ontario. It's entirely bizarre. And, and, I mean, that, that fails a basic test of economics. Premier, I, I can't believe that you actually believe that. I, I can't believe that you've been so insulated from what's happening in towns across our province and, and cities. I can't believe you're that out of touch. When you double hydro rates in the province of Ontario, when Ontario's gone from having the most competitive hydro rates to among the most expensive for business in the province, there's a cost for that. And sadly, the cost is that bills are going up by about $500 for an average family in our province. And they're driving manufacturing jobs out of the province of Ontario. So let me ask a very simple question to the Premier again, because I think she gave me the option of what's a basic rule of economics. Does the Premier believe there is a direct causal relationship between skyrocketing hydro rates and the hollowing out of our middle class, the loss of manufacturing jobs in Ontario? Yes or no? <laughs> Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I would, uh, I would reply to the Leader of the Opposition. Does he believe simplistically that there is only one condition that creates opportunity for business, Mr. Speaker? Does the Leader of the Opposition believe that it was <laughs> not necessary to invest in transmission, to invest in the upgrade of our grid, to invest in generating capacity when the fact is when we came into office, Mr. Speaker, there was not a stable supply of electricity in this province. There was no, not a predictability that uh, businesses Order. could count on. So we made those Your investments, Mr. Speaker, nothing. and the reality is that there is a, there's a full range of conditions that need to be in place, including making sure people have the right skills so that they can fill the jobs that are necessary, Mr. Speaker. Making sure that there are roads and bridges and transit in place, Mr. Speaker, that infrastructure that's so necessary. So, Mr. Speaker, I'd ask the leader of the of the opposition, does he believe that those things are important? Because those are the things that we have been putting in place, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. I believe one thing is most important above all else. That's the creation of good, steady jobs that can pay income, you can survive on and grow your economy. Look, you ask me, do I think energy is the only cause? Well, no. It's the increase of taxes in the province of Ontario. It's a growing, growing red tape. It's a record deficit and record debt in our province. It's a giveaway to the public sector unions. It's a government that has no clue about economics. Is there one rule for this? No, there's plenty, Premier. I can go on and on if you want me to. The bottom line, though, is when you're in a hole, you stop digging. Your rule is you dig a little slower and get the hole deeper. Why in the world do you want to continue with Dalton McGuinty's failed green energy subsidies, putting wind turbines across the province, like giant pins on a pin cushion? It's economic madness. It's costing us jobs. Why in the world are you continuing down you. Dalton McGuinty's failed path and costing us jobs? Thank you. Premier. The LTEP, the plan, review responds to a key priority for the Canadian manufacturers and exporters of Ontario. By providing greater clarity and certainty for manufacturers with respect to electricity rates going forward, the CMA supports new initiatives 
to enable manufacturers to better manage their energy and associated costs. Importantly, the plan will reduce overall system costs, which ultimately translates into more competitive forward rates for business. Mr. Speaker, there are some other voices that I will bring later on in subsequent questions. Okay, new question. <coughs> Leader of the Opposition. The, um, I, again, I, I do hope the Premier responds to these questions. And Premier, let me be very, very plain about this. You can't substitute in Bob Shirelli when you're before the committee today, the Justice Committee, to answer questions by Lisa McLeod. Stop the clock, please. Stop the clock, please. Stop the clock, please. Two things. Two things. First, I, I need it directed to the person you just carried on a conversation with. Direct your new question. And we use only titles and we only use uh, writings. Please. Thank you. Premier, question to the Premier, Speaker. Premier, respect for the environment. Substitute in the Energy Minister when you're before the Justice Committee today to answer basic questions about why you misled the Assembly and misled MPPs with what you knew about the gas plant scandal when you knew it. No substitutions, no timeouts. This afternoon, you're going to have to tell the truth. Let me ask you a basic question here, too. Very basic question. Yesterday in the legislature, you said that Ontario's energy rates for business were lower than bordering states and provinces. Premier, you know that is not a fact. Can you please tell me the source where Ontario's energy bills are lower for business question. than competing states and provinces? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Premier. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I. Uh, I've been clear that uh, that we are competitive, Mr. Speaker, with uh, with neighboring uh, with neighboring jurisdictions, and I also acknowledge that where there is uh, inexpensive hydro in Quebec and Manitoba, those those costs are less, Mr. Speaker. I've uh, I've been clear about that. But, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition, the leader of the opposition, is part of a party that neglected the electricity system. When we came into office, we needed to make those investments, Mr. Speaker. We have made those investments. And what the leader of the opposition would like to do now, Mr. Speaker, what stands for a plan from his side, Mr. Speaker, is he wants to invest in new nuclear that has been determined is not necessary, Mr. Speaker. So that $15 billion cost that is not necessary, he would like to go forward and make those. Investments. Our contention is, Mr. Speaker, that there are a number of conditions that need to be in place in order for business to thrive. Investment in people, infrastructure, and a business climate. That's what Thank you. Supplementary. <laughs> the, um, the Premier's reliance on 10-year-old briefing notes yes, blow the dust off them. Uh, when it's the biggest issue of our times and the loss of jobs in our province is, is truly frightening. And, and I want to say to you, Premier, too, the the shaky grip of this government on basic economics, the fact that higher hydro prices cost us jobs, uh, is it, truly frightening. We consider that's going to cause more damage to the province of Ontario. And I have no understanding why you think the right decision when we're hemorrhaging jobs, 3,000 manufacturing jobs a month, Premier, under your leadership alone, why you would double down on Dalton McGuinty's failed policies of subsidizing wind and solar. There's a business I visited recently. They can create jobs in Ontario or the state of Texas. They have plants in both places. They're an Ontario company. They're dedicated Question. to jobs. But they say, Tim, when hydro rates are 70 percent cheaper in Texas for the business in the province of Ontario, where are you going to put the jobs? Premier, how can you answer that question when your very policies you. are driving hydro rates to the roof and costing us jobs? Thank you. Daily basis? Right. you see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier? Andy, you've got to get up. Mr. Speaker, uh, I know that previously, in some kind of a white paper, the Leader of the Opposition uh, said that he was going to eliminate renewables from the system and use that to subsidize the industrial rates. But, Mr. Wow. Speaker, the wind and, and solar represents roughly less than 4 percent of the total generation, Mr. Speaker. His numbers don't add up. He couldn't come close to subsidizing industry. The member from Chatham Kent Essex will come to order. The member from Bruce here on Bruce will come to order, and the member for Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. Carry on. Again, Mr. Speaker, his numbers don't add up. He's going to get rid of them out of the energy mix, yes. and he's going to use the money saved to subsidize uh, industrial prices, Mr. Speaker. We've done the calculations. We've looked Answer. at it, and it doesn't work. It doesn't add up. It's like your budget and everything else you're talking about. The numbers just don't Thank add you. up. Final you know, I want to, um, Premier, directly to you, just express my sincere disappointment 
that on basic questions around the biggest issue in our province, jobs and the economy, that you shove them off and hand them off to a minister. Play political games. Like, I, I worry that it's either weak leadership or you don't understand the, the basic economics that are at stake here. You have made deliberate decisions over 10 years to drive up our hydro rates. Our hydro rates have more than doubled. We saw yesterday what was nothing more than a short-term plan for Liberal re-election interests. The problem is it has a long-term lasting impact on our competitiveness and jobs for families across the province of Ontario. Premier, your plan has been an abject failure. Hydro rates are going through the roof. It's costing us jobs on a daily basis. You're eroding the middle class. You're taking away hope from those who actually want to work in the province Question. of Ontario and create jobs. We have a plan to make energy affordable, to lower taxes, to cut the red tape, to make Ontario rise again, to make us a beacon for investment and job creation. If you Thank can't you. handle this job, step aside. Thank we you. will. Mr. Speaker, uh, the same graphs that he was looking at in the long-term energy plan will disclose the following. For an industrial consumer with a demand of 5 megawatts per month, yep. our 2010 plan had projected that in 2014, next year, they would be paying $109 per megawatt hour. Wow. Under this plan and the graphs that are in the plan, the 2013 long-term energy plan projects that would only be $87 per megawatt hour. Going down. This is an unbelievable improvement for the industrial sector, yeah. Mr. Speaker. He is only reading part of the plan. He's not reading the whole plan. He should be properly briefed himself. Thank you. No question. The leader of the third party. Thank you. I want to give the member an opportunity to put her question properly. Order, please. Leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Speaker. The, the uh, question is to the Premier. Ontario families and businesses are already paying the highest electricity rates in Canada, and yesterday the government confirmed their plan to send them even higher. Ontarians expect, uh, or at least hope, that the people that they elect to represent them will actually protect their interests when it comes to electricity rates. As a member of Cabinet, the Premier signed off on a plan Minister that of added Education, millions come to, order. to the government's private power deal in Oakville. Why did she do that, Speaker? Thank you, Premier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as the leader of the third party knows, I have agreed to appear before the committee again today uh, to repeat uh, the uh, to answer the questions that uh, will be asked of me and to repeat the information that I have uh, that I've uh, given to this House and to the committee previously. And I'm I'm happy to uh, continue to answer those questions, Mr. Speaker. But what the what the leader of the third party also knows is that we have put a plan for energy in place, Mr. Speaker. The answer is being provided by your today. Premier. I have no idea what the plan of the third party is, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. They do not agree with us on green energy. They don't agree with us on nuclear refurbishment, Mr. Speaker. They don't agree on any of the uh, investments that we have made. So I don't know what their plan is, Mr. Speaker, but what I do know is that we have to have a long-term stable plan. That's what we have. We put that in place, and uh, that, will be, that will give some predictability to industry and in the province. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the auditor made it clear that the agreement the Premier signed was part of a political strategy to ensure that the public didn't hear about the cancellation uh, as the province was heading into an election. In her testimony at hearings into the gas plant scandal, the Premier claimed that she simply signed off on a plan that was put in front of her and didn't ask any questions as to how it might affect the people stuck with the bill. Is that the Premier's defence for this decision, Speaker, that she was just being a team player for the Liberal campaign? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, we've been over this ground many times, and I will go over it again in answer to questions in the committee this afternoon. But, Mr. Speaker, the, the leader of the third party knows that there was a decision that was made to cancel uh, and relocate gas plants. That was a decision that was agreed by all the parties was the right thing to do, Mr. Speaker. I was part of a cabinet that made that decision. There was a negotiation process that was being engaged, Mr. Speaker, and I did not have the details of what was going to happen at that, uh, at that table. So I've been over that ground. I will go over it again at committee, Mr. Speaker, but I think the leader of the third party knows that the decision that was made is one that was supported by everyone. Final supplementary. 
Well, Speaker, one thing I think the Premier needs to know is that people of Ontario know that just because the Liberals say it doesn't mean it's true. That's right. as, uh, as Liberal campaign co-chair in the 2000 election campaign, Speaker, the Premier heard about her party's commitment to cancel a gas plant in Mississauga, and given her role in the Oakville negotiations, she must have been pretty aware that this, too, would hit ratepayers hard. Did she place any calls or raise any concerns with the campaign team, or did she decide once again to make her priority helping the Liberal campaign? Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the, the member for, from Toronto Danforth, a member of this leader's caucus, understands, and his, what he said on April 11th, I don't see it as a smoking gun. We knew the Cabinet was approving this process, so this does not surprise me. Mr. Speaker, it was part of a process. It's a process that I have outlined many times and will no doubt have a chance to outline again this afternoon at committee. The reality is that I have taken responsibility. I have said that there were decisions made that should have been made in a better way, Mr. Speaker. What member is very from Bruce Gray, is that we have in place a process that will mean that this will not happen again, that the community will be, uh, will be, com will be engaged in a different way, Mr. Speaker, so that, so that this, this, this kind of decision yes, will not be made again. And, and the member, uh, the leader of the third party, knows that I've taken responsibility for that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. Leader of the third Thank party. You, Speaker, my next question is also to the Premier. People hear the Premier talking about doing things differently, but all they see is the same cynical approaches and tired ideas that got us where we are. People feel like they've been abandoned, Speaker. Karen wrote us to say this, and I quote, My last hydro bill, I had to ask my daughter to cover me for me, and she could barely help as she has major student loans to pay back. I am tired of working and not getting ahead. When will this end? Unquote. What does the Premier have to say to women like Karen Speaker, who expect their Premier to have their back when it comes to their electricity bills? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, again, I, uh, I sympathize with people who are struggling, Mr. Speaker. It's why we have put a number of supports in place, Mr. Speaker. Whether it's a tuition rebate, Mr. Speaker, whether it's uh, support for uh, young families child with uh, children, the Ontario Child Benefit, whether it's, uh, Mr. Speaker, whether it's a reduction on the electricity bills, the uh, clean energy benefit, Mr. Speaker, we have put those. We have put those in place. But, Mr. Speaker, Karen and all. All of the residents of Ontario need to have a reliable energy source, Mr. Speaker. They need to know that when they turn the lights, when they go to turn the lights on, that the lights are going to come on, Mr. Speaker. And in order for that to be the case, the government must have a plan. The leader of the third party does not have a plan. No one knows how she would keep the lights on in this province, Mr. Speaker. Everyone knows that we have a predictable and stable plan, and that plan was released yesterday. And I would have thought that she would have supported the conservation at least aspects of that, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question? Uh, sorry, supplementary. Speaker, the Premier's sympathy is not going to help Karen pay her hydro bill. The scandal with the gas plants, unfortunately, is not an isolated. Stop the clock. Order. Order. Leader. The scandal with the gas plants is not an isolated incident, unfortunately. Too many people, uh, too many people, it's become a symbol of the government's absolute indifference to people struggling to make ends meet and to hold on to good jobs. Wayne works with a large manufacturer, and he writes, and I quote, "Our jobs may be on the line due to rising hydro rates." To, um, too many uh, middle class. Uh, oh, right. Sorry. To have a middle class, you must have manufacturing. That's a fact the world over. But maybe those in charge don't want a middle class. Unquote. What does the premier have Question? to say to Wayne Speaker and thousands like him who thinks the government's hydro policy may cost them their job? 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I would I would want to make sure that uh, people who are concerned about uh, about industrial rates understand that we have put programs in place because we acknowledge that there are uh, concerns. The industrial electricity incentive, Mr. Speaker, uh, as of 2013, eligible companies qualify for electricity rates that are among the lowest in North America, Mr. Speaker, in exchange for creating new jobs. So we've made that connection. The industrial conservation initiative helps large consumers save on uh, on costs by incenting them to shift their uh, their hours of use, Mr. Speaker. And the Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program puts in place a, a reduction for northern industrial consumers and reduces their cost by 25 percent, Mr. Speaker. So it's very important that people understand that we do acknowledge that there are concerns in the industrial sector. Uh, the Minister of Energy has just uh, noted some quotes from yesterday yes, that sir. manufacturers and industri industries understand that the predictability is important and that we have these programs in place. So I would hope that they understand Thank you. But that's the case, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, people uh, worried about keeping good jobs and uh, making ends meet feel that this government simply doesn't care about their challenges, and the mess in the electricity system proves it. People are tired of paying the price for the government that just doesn't seem to get it. Instead of offering real change, we see the government scrambling to hide the damage that they've done. Does the Premier have anything to offer people? who are feeling the squeeze like never before, or does she agree with her minister that the mess this government's made in our electricity system is simply a fact of life? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Actually, what we have done since we came into office is we've been cleaning up a mess, Mr. Speaker, that was left by the previous two governments. We have made investments that were necessary. We have made sure that the grid has been upgraded, Mr. Speaker. We're dealing with with um, communities that need support, Mr. Speaker, that need energy, Remember and we're Chatham, we'll working come on order. building that infrastructure so that they will have the energy supply that's necessary, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that cleaning the air, that cleaning the air is not a priority for either of the opposition parties, which is surprising, actually, Mr. Speaker, because I would have thought that green energy, at least for the NDP, would have been a priority. Apparently, it's not. But creating jobs in the green energy sector, cleaning up the air, making sure we have a stable energy supply, those are our, pr our priorities, Mr. Speaker. And we've been working on that, cleaning up the mess that was left Thank by you. the previous two governments. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question. Member from Nepean Carlton. My question is, is also to the Premier. Your energy plan will cost Ontario families anywhere between 30 to 50 percent more. That's, that's on average $400 per family. Um, your energy policy is also going to lower the standard of living in Ontario. As Ontario families decide they need to lower their energy bills, they're going to have to shut off the lights, shut off the heat, shut off their appliances. I think you owe it to, Thunder Bay, the Atacocu, come to, order, the province, to tell them exactly how much this rate increase is due Second time, to the from Thunder Bay, energy Atacocu, policy, come to order. as well as to those cancelled gas plants. We'd really like to know, because the only party with a plan at the present moment to make those more affordable is our plan under PC Leader Tim Thank you. Three more. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker. The member should know by now that the cost of relocating those gas plants is not even in the system yet. It won't be three or four years before that, Mr. Speaker. And by that time, by that time, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, 
We've taken $20 billion out of the cost base, including $15 billion, billion for new nuclear. That is going to push rates down as we move forward, Mr. Speaker. The Member from Lambton, forward, Mr. Speaker, will be an average of 2.8 per cent. Mr. Speaker, again, they look at the graphs in the plan and they will pick out a couple of years where there is excessive pressure on prices. They will not look at the overall plan that will show that the reduction over 20 years is 2.8 per cent per year. Mr. Speaker, there is no way to avoid electricity cost increases. Neither leader on the other Thank side you. has given a commitment to re Thank you. I'm astonished. His short-term energy plan in the long run is going to cost at least one billion more dollars on the rate base. What else are they hiding from the public from this long-term energy plan? That actually confirms our suspicion that you released that report yesterday solely to distract the public from the Premier attending the gas plant hearings today. Speaker, I want to go back to this jobs issue. It's not only families and seniors who are suffering as a result of these rate hikes. We have lost 300,000 manufacturing drugs across the, uh, uh, across the province. She is making Bob Ray blush by sending so many jobs south. We are now the only jurisdiction in the world who relies on losing jobs as a conservation plan, Speaker. We have received letters from a number of organizations, including businesses, Question. who tell us that the average industrial electricity price in Ontario is double the average of Manitoba, Quebec, and Michigan. It's not just homeowners who are suffering. It is the business community. Why are you sending you. our jobs south? The uh, member from Oxford come to order, the member the Minister of the Environment come to order, the member from the Pian Carlton come to order, the member from Anglington Lawrence come to order. Thank you. Minister of Energy. I'll be happy to speak for the Minister of Finance on jobs, Mr. Speaker. The Minister and the Premier have stood up on a regular basis, Mr. Speaker, and indicated throughout the recession period and coming. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound will come to order. That's the second time. The member from Durham come to order. Finish, please. Created more than 460 net new jobs coming out of the recession between the recession and now. The member from Lambton, Kim Middlesex, come to order. I will say that 31,000 of those jobs are in the clean energy sector. To keep them on and and renewables and wind and solar and biomass, Mr. Speaker. There is a huge industry here in Ontario which we've created, and part of those 460 jobs are coming right out of the energy sector, and they need to look the people Answer. in the eye who are creating those jobs, creating those new companies, and tell them that they're going to make it stop, Mr. Speaker. Exactly, Bob. Your question, the member from Welland. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Canadian manufacturers and exporters have said that electricity costs can be a deal breaker, yep. but the Energy Minister uh, has called skyrocketing costs a fact of life. Ten years of Liberal government has put the unemployment rate in Ontario higher than the national average. It's time to get our hydro bills under control so that we can grow and create jobs. Why is the Liberal government more interested in their political fortunes than getting hydro rates under control so we can create jobs? Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm happy to talk about jobs in this province. I want to talk about Roger Martin's prosperity tax force that was uh, his report was released, released last week and he said one of the things and this is a quotation from uh, their report few comparable regions outside of North America have an economy that is as competitive and prosperous as Ontarians yeah. Ontario's Ontario's GDP per capita is higher than the median of the 12 international peer regions identified by the task force thanks in part to a highly skilled workforce stable economy and diverse mix of productive industry 
Ministries. He, go on, go on, he goes on to say the Ontario government's 2013 fall economic statement is commendable for its focus on infrastructure, possible tax reforms, and investments in human capital. And he says Answer. that Ontario's tax system is now one of the most business friendly in the OEC OECD, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Well, well, Speaker, business leaders in Niagara have identified lower hydro rates as being one of their top priorities when it comes to attracting manufacturing investment and creating jobs. Alternatively, high hydro prices are the biggest issue facing new development and expansions, as Mayor Bradley of Sarnia has said about Nova Chemicals' expansion plans. Companies that are already seeing costs as deal breakers can expect a 40 percent increase over the next five years. Is the Premier going to get hydro rates under control so businesses can grow and create jobs? No. Or is high unemployment, just like skyrocketing hydro costs, just another Liberal fact of life? Minister. Well, thank you again, Mr. Speaker. And I want to say, of course, electricity prices are a factor in business decisions and investment decisions for this province. But I think, I think it's important that all of us pause for a moment and recognize just the opposition parties, I think, are getting close to a line. Because if investors from other countries are looking at us today and at this moment, and they hear how the opposite, official opposition is talking down manufacturing and say, don't come here because it's too expensive, and now we have this party as well talking down our manufacturers and the hard efforts of our employers and the importance of investing here. I think we all have a responsibility. Mr. Speaker, 40 percent of the manufacturing in this country is located here in this province. Nearly a million people are employed in this sector. We work hard for them every day. We've created nearly 500,000 jobs since the bottom of the recession. We've created the Eastern Economic Development Fund in southwestern Ontario. We're going to continue to work hard for our manufacturers and for all of our employers and businesses Thank around you. the province. Question, the member from Scarborough Leisure Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Speaker, yesterday the Minister introduced Ontario's new long-term energy plan. The plan set out the province's priorities and initiatives for meeting the energy needs of Ontarians for the next 20 years. We all know that energy policy has been a topic of discussion in Ontario these days, and for good reasons, Mr. Speaker. It is an issue that affects every Ontarian directly. In my riding of Scarborough Asian Corps, I frequently hear concerns from the constituents wondering how they can lower the electricity bills. Given that electricity is an important issue for Ontarians, the release of this plant is very timely. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can he please tell the House what are some of the highlights from the lo new long-term energy plan? Speaker, I thank the member from Scarborough Asian Court, Court for her question. Uh, the new plan is a balanced approach to meeting energy needs today and for generations to come. The from Renfrew will the come plan to is order. based on what we heard from First Nations and Métis communities, stakeholders, municipalities, and consumers from across Ontario. This plan is built around five key principles, cost-effectiveness, reliability, clean energy, community engagement, and putting conservation first. Great. The members' constituents will be happy to know that we have taken several very significant steps to reduce the rate of increases to their hydro bills. Compared to the previous long-term energy plan, an average consumer can expect to pay about $520 less over the next five years less. and about $3,800 less to 2030, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. It is certainly a significant amount of real savings for families and small businesses. One element of the new plan that I found particularly interesting is the introduction of the new financing tools for home energy renovations. I know that conservation is the best way for families to lower their energy bills. I also understand that the new long-term energy plan includes a commitment to foster a culture of conservation in Ontario by encouraging and empowering consumers to reduce their consumptions. Minister, you also spoke about energy literacy as one way that we as educating and educate and empower consumers to make choices how to reduce the consumption. It sounds like the online financing has a potential to, for another powerful tools for consumers to look at for lowering their energy, energy bills. Speaker, Question. to the minister, can he please inform the House about the details on the on-bill financing and clarify how it might reduce the cost for consumers Thank in terms you. of this program? 
Thank, Thank you. you, Speaker. Yes, sir. Uh, on bill financing for home energy retrofits is another step towards empowering consumers to control their electricity consumption. Specifically, it helps consumers finance energy efficient projects in their home and business, which will save them money in the long run, Mr. Speaker. Similar programs in neighboring juris jurisdictions like Manitoba and New York have been very successful in allowing people to make upgrades to their homes with no upfront cost and a convenient low interest repayment model. Over the long run, savings on energy bills can surpass the cost of the renovations, achieving a net savings for consumers while helping to protect the environment and lower system costs to the province. On-bill financing is one more way the new long-term energy plan is empowering consumers to lowering their energy bills. Thank you. New question. The member from New Market Aurora. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, yesterday the Minister of Health explained why she could claim ignorance about the latest revelations about Chris Mazza's multi-million dollar salaries. She confirmed that she received a forensic audit report that was conducted by the government in December of 2011 that gave the details of those salaries, but she confirmed for us that neither she nor her deputy bothered to even open the envelope. It was sent directly to the OPP, she said. Speaker, this was a forensic audit of the operations and financial dealings of an organization embroiled in scandal under her watch. And this minister tells us that she didn't even bother to open the envelope. <clears throat> I ask the question. After displaying such gross incompetency, why is this minister still in your cabinet? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, because she's an excellent health minister and she is transforming the health care system so it will be sustainable for generations to come, Mr. Speaker. That's why she's still in office. And Mr. Speaker, I know that the I know that the Minister of Health is going to want to speak to the specifics of this question in the supplementary, but I want the member opposite to remember that this is the Minister of Health who ordered the forensic audit in the first place, Mr. Speaker. This is the Minister of Health. This is the Minister of Health who based on the findings of the report brought in the OPP to investigate. This Minister of Health has made sure that her reactions to the situation were immediate, Mr. Speaker, and were appropriate. And I know, Mr. Speaker, that the member opposite actually knows that, and he also knows that if we don't transform the health care system in the ways that the minister is doing it, it will not be sustainable over time. That's why she is doing the job, and she's doing it in a very good way, Mr. Speaker. And I'm Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the best way to transform the health care system is to get rid of this minister. There are two issues here. There are two issues, Speaker. One is that the minister ordered a forensic uh, audit and then didn't bother to look at it to see exactly what the details were. The second is that the minister was in contempt of parliament because she knows full well that the Standing Committee on Public Accounts asked for every piece of correspondence and information that related to the financials of Orange and especially all of the payments made to Mazza be tabled with that committee. She had the information. She may not have looked at it. She knew it was there. The committee on public accounts was denied that information. I say to the, to the Premier this. Her excellent Minister of Health Question. failed the people of this province she held the committee in contempt. I ask her once again, why does she continue to hold the portfolio Thank that you. she does? She's not worthy Thank of you. the title. Thank you. Please. 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 Thank you. Premier. In long term care. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker. And, uh, you know, I think the member opposite needs to do his homework oh. because. If he did his homework, he would know that a government member, the member from Guelph, asked, asked Orange at committee for all payments made to Dr. Mazza from all Orange entities. That information was tabled with committee a year ago. It was publicly released, Speaker, in January of this year, all but that personal information that could not be released. That information has been 
at committee for a year to suggest that we are hiding anything is absolutely bogus. When it is absolutely true, it is tabled and released publicly, Speaker. From Gore-Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. So, Minister, uh, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Health ordered a forensic audit of Orange when she realized that there were some serious problems going on. But when the audit team delivered their report, their findings, the minister did not bother to read the report, did not bother to read the, the findings. At the same time, despite the fact that we were studying this issue in a legislative committee, despite the fact that there was ongoing investigations, and despite the fact that there was legislation tabled in this House. Can the minister explain to Ontarians why she was not interested in what the audit team had to find? Well, Speaker, I appreciate, the uh, the, uh, appreciate the opportunity to provide some clarity. There was a request from a member of the government side to release all payments made to Maza. That information was released a year ago to Standing Committee on Public Accounts. In addition, separate issue, I ordered a forensic audit. There was a, the, I, the forensic investigation team from the Ministry of Finance went in, did that forensic audit. They reported, I got, received an interim report in February. At, in, uh, there was enough in that interim report for me to refer the matter to the Ontario Provincial Police. They are doing that investigation. The interim report concerned me enough, I referred it to the OPP. When in July of 2012, the, uh, the final report came in, it was provided to the deputy, and he returned the envelope unopened with the following explanation. Answer. For clarity, as the report is being provided to the OPP, I have not read, copied, or otherwise accessed the report that FIT provided to my office so as not to Thank in you. inadvertently. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Health has indicated that she was far too trusting of Dr. Mazza. But it seems again the Minister of Health has missed the point. The Minister of Health of the Province of Ontario, it's not her job to be trusting, it's her job to provide oversight of all the services provided. And this government has failed in its oversight of Orange. It was this government that was fully aware of questions asked by the NDP long before Orange made headlines in the newspapers. It was this government that failed to address whistleblowers who raised issues and concerns about Orange. It was this government that allowed Orange to fall off of the sunshine, the sunshine list. Question. It was this government that failed to provide oversight. Will this, administer, will this minister admit that she did not do her job? Minister of Health, long term care. Spe speaker, let me repeat. In uh, December 22, 2011, I ordered, a for, uh, I ordered a forensic audit. The audit team was there the next day, Speaker. By February, they issued an interim report. I read that interim report. The interim report was troubling enough that I referred the matter to the OPP. We, on this side, let the police do the job of policing, Speaker. When the final report was, uh, was, was delivered in July, the Deputy Minister, and I'm going to That's take the opportunity to finish this, for CMP clarity, as the report is being right. provided to the OPP, I have not read, copied, or otherwise accessed the report provided to my office so as not to inadvertently impact the ongoing OPP investigation, and in the interest of transparency, I am returning the single hard copy of the report that was received. This is appropriate protocol followed appropriately. Please. 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 New question. The member from Etobicoke North. Arrest the few Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Social Services, Mr. Ted McMeekin. Constituency work are inspired by individuals who are, of course, looking out for their families, striving to put bread on the table and enter Ontario's labour market. This struggle to integrate or to reintegrate into the workforce is especially telling and poignant in persons with disabilities. 
Though Ontario has led the country in job creation since the recession, with numbers cited during this question period, persons with disabilities can, of course, find this quite challenging. Speaker, can the minister please inform this chamber? What is our government doing en route to creating a more just and prosperous society to help people with a disability enter or re-enter the job market? Thank you, Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the member for his question and his commitment. Uh, as a government, we're focused uh, more on people's abilities than the alleged disability, and that's in, in large part why the budget spoke about the partnership table that we're creating uh, to, in fact, work with employers to employ folks with, uh, with developmental challenges. We're interested in creating jobs for everyone, regardless of their age, uh, their ability, their sexual orientation, ethnicity. And we're doing a pretty good job of that, to be frank, uh, Mr. Speaker. The employment supports component of the ODSP provides employment assistance for people with disabilities who are interested in preparing for employment. Uh, and in fact, this program has had uh, 4,537 clients enter the program, wow. receiving Answer. supports, and some 2,264 have actually uh, found employment, Mr. Speaker. Now, I, I want to compliment the federal government here. They've been helpful in terms of providing funding. The uh, Thank you. contract is, is winding up. We, we hope it can be renegotiated. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for the update on the ODSP and labour issues. I know, of course, firsthand that folks with disabilities in my own riding are having some measure of success through these funding opportunities. I think they would also be encouraged to learn that negotiations between the governments of Canada and Ontario are proceeding, I understand, in a positive, collaborative and salutary direction. This, of course, will affect many, many residents in my own riding of Etobicoke North, and I think it's important that we build on the past successes. I believe it's part of the mandate and responsibility of all governments to stand up for these people to ensure that they get the supports that they need and deserve. Speaker, would the minister please share with this House what might be the impacts of a reconfigured labour market agreement? Minister. Um, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of uh, Training Colleges and Universities. Speaker, the, and universities. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the labour market agreement for persons with disabilities serves a very important role in providing support for pe persons with disabilities, trying to break down the barriers to employment. The federal government has announced its intentions to introduce a new generation of this agreement, but has not yet put a proposal on the table. Speaker, it is so critical that these changes build on the success of the existing agreement and the programs currently supported. It's my hope that the federal government will consider the successes of this agreement when they make these changes. Unfortunately, their approach to the labour market agreement, which funds our most vulnerable workers, would suggest otherwise. Mr. Speaker, that approach has us right now, has the federal government cutting 60 per cent of funding for those very important programs that Answer. serve the most vulnerable popula population. We hope, Mr. Speaker, they take a different approach with this new agreement that here, serves our, our people with disabilities in this province. Here, here. Thank you. New question. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Minister, I've asked you this question before and you didn't give me an answer, so I'm going to ask you again. With your 15 per cent auto insurance reduction effort, all of the province's non-standard auto insurance companies have been called in by Fisco and directed to reduce their rates. Of course, non-standard companies insure the worst drivers on the road. They insure people with poor driving records, have multiple speeding tickets, and worst of all, those with drunk driving offences. Are you pleased with rewarding Ontario's worst drivers? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. The member opposite makes reference to uh, the non-standard auto insurance that, in fact, do provide sort of a system of last resort for those individuals with bad driving records. The fact of the matter is they represent about 1.5 to 3 percent of the market, and they are not the ones that we're targeting. We're targeting safe drivers. We're targeting and protecting consumers, and the member opposite should be supporting our initiatives to lower premiums for all the consumers in this province who are suffering because of high cost of claims and auto fraud task force that's been commissioned by our government over the last number of years is helping us reduce those costs of claims, and that is what we're doing to try to protect consumers in our marketplace. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, you've missed the target and you've hit uh, the Ontario's worst drivers with rate reduction. Minister, this morning, Mothers Against Drunk Driving issued a press release drawing attention 
to your irresponsible policy. They rightfully say that the biggest benefits in terms of dollars will go to the most dangerous drivers on the roads. Minister, in your rush to appease the NDP and cling desperately to power, you've implemented a policy clearly without thinking about the consequences. It seems the message you want to send to drunk drivers is don't worry about your high premiums. If we need to pander to the NDP's demands to stay in power, you will be first in line to get your lower rates. Now that Matt has come out and exposed the dangers of your price-fixing scheme, will you finally admit that you have not thought through the policy, correct your mistake, and implement our four-point plan to reduce driving for our rates for good drivers in this province? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the member opposite talks about a plan that they don't have and they've just sort of done on the fly. We've been at this for a number of years to try to support the 9 million consumers. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London will withdraw. Withdraw. Great. Mr. Speaker, our commitment that we've been doing on this side of the House is to bring down rates for Ontario's 9 million drivers. The member opposite is spinning, talking about drunk drivers and those that have bad records. They're not the ones that are going to benefit from these initiatives because they are the worst drivers. And there's going to always have to be a last insurer of last resort to accommodate them, but they're not benefiting from this, Mr. Speaker. The ones that are going to benefit are safe drivers, the ones that institute a number of initiatives to bring down their rates. We are going to work with them and the other 9 million Answer. drivers to bring those rates down for consumers. The member opposite should stand with us on this, and they should support consumers in our province. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. Question? The member from Timmins, James Bay. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Minister, last Friday in Sudbury, Quite unfortunate. We had a number of fatalities as a result of accidents on highways uh, in and around Sudbury. We had two people that died as a result of a three-vehicle crash on Highway 17 west of Webwood, and then we had another person die as a result of an accident single vehicle on Highway 6 just between Little Current and Espanola. Considering that you reported to this House and you reported to myself and other Northern members that you've increased the number of equipment that are on highways, why is it that highways are still being closed in Northern Ontario, where we never used to see that in the past? Thank you. The member from the Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Mr. Speaker, first of all, uh, my heart, and I know that of my colleagues here in the House, goes out to the people who have lost loved ones in a, a, a very tragic accident. I think, Mr. Speaker, for all of us who live in northern climates with icy winter roads uh, and who have lived in parts of this country where it gets very cold, this is the, a reality that is all too often and all too tragically part of, of life. Uh, so my prayers and heart, heartfelt thanks go to the family. Mr. Speaker, we as a government have added 50 different crews in northeastern and northwestern Ontario. It is the largest expansion in the history of Ontario in snow removal and winter maintenance. We have also required now that those companies have to replace all of their equipment at the rate of 10 per cent per year, so over every decade all equipment will be new. MTO staff are working on stronger uh, reviews and working with municipal leaders. We have the safest roads and highways uh, in North America with the lowest Answer. fatality rates, Mr. Speaker. These investments will, over this winter, reduce those accident rates, and I've worked with the member opposite and will continue to, Thank you. to identify these obstacles and solve them. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, I'm shocked that you would say it's a reality that people have to die while driving on roads in northern Ontario. That, quite frankly, is not acceptable as an answer. But I'm going to ask you again. We in Northern Ontario want to let you into a little secret. It's been sowing for centuries and for millennia. And for years, when we had MTO take care of our highways, we never had conditions of roads as we see them today. Last Friday, we had three fatalities just in the Sudbury area. There was another fatality on Highway 69. And the question is, why is it that we're having the amount of road closures and the amount of accidents as compared to before? So I ask you again. Despite the increase of equipment that you announced yet but about a few weeks ago, why is it that we are still having some of the worst road conditions as a result of your highway maintenance? Mr. 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 Speaker, what I, what I said is that icy roads and driving conditions in a northern climate are the reality. I have lost friends in, in traffic fatalities. Uh, it is 
I, I think if you, and I read every single police report that comes forward, uh, and I look at the names of everyone who's lost, and I, as a minister, will tell you that safety uh, for me and for the Premier and for this government is our single biggest priority. We have fewer fatalities and accidents in the safe, safest roads in North America, better than dry, warm places like Kansas and California, which is quite remarkable. But we take every fatality, which means we have maintained the same standards. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think this is serious. I did not interrupt the member office. We're talking about people's lives here, and this government takes this quite seriously. For us, it's not politics, Mr. Answer. Speaker. So I will be monitoring how those 50 new crews are deployed. I will continue to work with Minister Mayer to mo monitor the policing uh, and enforcement, and we will continue to look at every cause and solve every Thank obstacle you. there is to public Question. safety, Mr. Member Speaker. From Glengarry, Prescott Russell. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, the Minister was recently in Ottawa holding a land use planning workshop at Carleton University with, with environmental groups, developers, and municipalities, including Ottawa, North Dundas, Renfrew, South Glengarry, and Russell, from my own riding of Glengarry Prescott Russell. Like many Ontarians, my constituents have numerous questions about how the land use planning and appeal system works and the role of the Ontario Municipal Board. Some find the current process complicated, difficult to navigate, and even harder to understand. Speaker, our government needs to ensure that our planning system works well for municipalities, community groups, and for developers, while remaining responsive to the challenging needs of our community. Speaker, through you, to the minister, can the minister explain to my constituents and all of Ontarians about how they can get involved in this important review? Thank you. Question. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker, and thank question. you to the member for the question. I was happy uh, last Thursday, November 21st, to join the member from Ottawa Centre uh, as he held and initiated a consultation in Carleton University to discuss our review of the land use planning process. And this system gives municipalities the tools to manage growth so that we can all build cities and towns that we want to live in, to work in, and to raise our families. And, but we've heard from municipal leaders from across the province and from planners and developers and the public that the rules are sometimes complex and a little bit uh, the delays and the appeals are frustrating. So that's why our government has held regional workshops in Kitchener-Waterloo, in Ottawa, as I said, in Sault Ste. Marie and Thunder Bay. We're also going to hold one in my riding of, uh, in Peel Region on Thursday. And in Toronto, uh, we're going to shortly hear from everyday Ontarians on how we can make the system more responsive to Ontario's changing needs. And for those that can't make it in person, Answer. you can go to the website. We have a full consultation book guidebook that will give everybody a chance to give their suggestions. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you, uh, Minister. It's great to hear that our government is focused on giving municipalities the tools they need to be able to pl plot their own destiny and build a community that works for their residents. But despite that, Speaker, development, whether it's in Ottawa or Sudbury, Niagara Falls or Windsor, or even in my riding or Rockland, uh, in my riding of Glengarry Prescott Russell, it can still be contentious, Mr. Speaker. Though many communities are happy to welcome new residents, many are worried that the increased density will mean that strains on schools, uh, infrastructure and highways and our waste and stormwater systems will be pushed to capacity. And they're concerned that these new houses, apartments or stores that are being built, that the current taxpayer will be on the hook for the necessary Answer but expensive Answer my question. <laughs> Speaker, through you to the minister. Could the minister explain to my constituents how, uh, how this review of development charges could help my community prepare for potential thank you. growth? Minister. Again, speaker, I'd like to thank the member for the question. Communities across Ontario are all experiencing the kind of changes the member speaks about that are happening in Ottawa and the surrounding region. And Our government has been working with municipalities to ensure that the development doesn't mean that existing taxpayers are on the hook for costs required for new development. However, we've heard that municipal leaders feel that the current system limits their ability to recover all of the capital costs for some of their services and their ability to pay for those vital infrastructure projects. We also heard from developers that they want more accountability and transparency. At the end of the day, I, I've heard from both groups that they want clarity, accountability and transparency. At the end of the, of the day, we believe it's time for a refresh 
and it's time to make sure the development charges system still answers all here, of the here. community's needs across Ontario. So I want to encourage Answer. all Ontarians to have their say. I want to hear solid ideas that help us deal with the roots of our challenges, and we want all Ontarians to have the tools Thank you. and plan for their future. Thank, Thank you, you, Speaker. The member from Halton. Minister, uh, to the Minister of Health, Mr. Speaker. Minister, the day you determine that Ontario's health care system doesn't include Kim Fletcher, the people of Ontario responded with their characteristic generosity and voted with their donations to help fund Kim's prescribed medication, Avastin, which your committee to evaluate drugs refused to list for OHIP coverage. I'm happy to say that despite your committee's obvious ill-advised conclusions, Kim Fletcher's condition is responding to the drug and a recent MRI shows that her tumour has stopped growing. Yeah. <laughs> Minister, do you feel any remorse over your inaction on Kim Fletcher's case in that the people of Ontario have taken it upon themselves to do your job? Question. Thank you. You see the trees? You see the trees? Thank you, Minister. Well, Speaker, first let me say that I am delighted that uh, Ms. Fletcher is uh, is seeing improvement. That is wonderful, yeah, yeah. and I am very, very pleased with that. The second thing I want to say is there are cases where government does not fund certain drugs for lack of evidence, and the community does come together because yeah, they collectively do want to support that, even though it would not be prudent for government to fund it for lack of evidence. So, Speaker, I do, uh, I, I do congratulate the people of Milton and other people in this province who do come together to give people the hope they need, access to a drug that, uh, um, uh, that may be yet not proven, but still important to the family. So I know many people on all sides Answer. of this House have, in fact, participated in fundraisers for members in their community where government simply is not in a position to, uh, to fund you. that particular procedure. Supplementary. Minister, you speak of Ontario I'm not familiar with. Kim, Kim is not a, a one-off. Jay is a young teenager who needs an eye operation coverage for which he has been denied even though the operation will save his sight. Norma has IBF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and needs the drug Aspirate in order for her to have the quality of life. She has also been denied. Minister, when will you stop letting your committee to evaluate drugs classify you as missing in action? When it comes to assisting Kim, Jay and Norma, Order. who have become victims of your irresponsible, hands-off approach to health care in Ontario. Question. When are you going to remedy the situation that they, their families, are facing, and indeed all Ontarians Thank you. may one day face? When, Thank Minister? You. When will you have? When Thank you. Have seated, please. Be, ple be seated, please. Thank you. Minister of Health. Well, Speaker, my, my question to the member opposite is when will we have a little uh, uh, intellectual honesty when it comes to the petition that he is raising? Speaker, the petition that the member reads every day is factually false. He reads from the Committee to Evaluate Drugs, but he fails to say, however, the committee noted that using historical estimates of survival as the basis for comparison is not reliable because treatment standards have evolved and historical rates are derived from studies that use older, Order, less please. effective treatments. Speaker, I think the member opposite owes it to the people he purports to represent to tell the truth and the whole truth. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion of Ms. Sandals on second reading of Bill 122, an act respecting collective bargaining on Ontario's school system. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
members take their seats, please? Would all members take their seats, please? All members, take your seats, please. On October 30th, 2013, Ms. Sandals moved second reading of Bill 122. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Millard. Mr. Millard. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Garrison. Mr. Garrison. Mr. Garrison. Mrs. Jeffrey. Mrs. Jeffrey. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mrs. Cansfield. Mrs. Cansfield. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Ms. Peruzza. Ms. Peruzza. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. McNeely. Mr. McNeely. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Torizetti. Mr. Torizetti. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Balkasin. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Donnerlock. Ms. Donnerlock. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Denova. Mr. Denova. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Marchese. Madame Jolina. Madame Jolina. Mr. Prue. Mr. Prue. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Van Mr. Van Mr. Shine. Mr. Shine. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. All those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Leone. Mr. Leone. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Holliday. Mr. Holliday. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. Ouellette. Mr. Ouellette. Mr. Ouellette. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Ms. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mrs. McKenna. Mrs. McKenna. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Milligan. Mr. Milligan. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. The ayes are 65, the nays are 31. One abstention. The ayes being 65 and the nays being 31, I declare the motion carried. Of the bill, does the election close you to one? Shall the bill be ordered for third reading? The Minister of Education. The bill refer be referred to the Standing Committee on the Legislative Assembly. So ordered. The Minister of Energy on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to correct the record on my uh, response to the uh, member from the Peen Carleton. The rate based costs of the relocated gas plants are included in the long term energy plan to commence when the plants are commissioned. Thank you. The minister is correct. They, uh, all members have an opportunity to correct a record, and he is at the point of order. Point of order, the member from the Peen Carleton. Members of the Ontario Progressive Conservative Caucus, that they were not given a copy of the Liberals' uh, long-term energy plan, I would, would wonder if the minister could provide that to the members of this house.
That's not a point of order. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.